Hello and welcome back! Are you curious to know the secret ingredient that might just turn the tide in favor of monarchies? I know it may sound like a grandiose claim, but it underpins an intriguing shift in the global perception of monarchies that we've uncovered through our latest research. Today, we will journey through the history and evolution of constitutional monarchies, examine the distinct roles and powers of monarchs as dictated by their respective constitutions. We'll highlight how some countries, like Norway, Denmark and the Netherlands, have placed the monarchy at the heart of their constitutional framework, attributing considerable space and prominence to their roles. We'll further dive into the constitutional powers of monarch, observing commonalities and exceptions across different nations. While the powers of monarchs have gradually been reduced over centuries, they still serve as the ultimate guardians of their constitutions. How they have defended democratic values during crisis will also be an area of focus. Finally, we'll present a fascinating trend that have emerged from our surveys conducted in 10 republics. We found that the perception towards monarchy dramatically shifted when we introduced the concept of an executive role for the monarch. This shift holds potential implications for monarchists, possibly pointing towards a strategy for reviving support for monarchies. Our aim today is not merely to explore historical and contemporary views of monarchy, but also to look ahead. Can the monarchy be reimagined to fit our modern world better? How can monarchists leverage this shift in perception to usher a renewed era of monarchy? These are some questions we'll attempt to answer. So sit back, engage, and let's uncover the possible future of monarchies together. While there are distinct characteristics that define each constitution in terms of their age, the prominence given to the monarchy, and the detail that outlines the monarch's powers and functions, the overwhelming commonality amongst these constitutions is the alignment of the monarch's powers. Constitutional monarchies in Europe largely possess similar authorities, and this similarity is often reflected in the near-identical terms in which these powers are expressed in the constitutional text. This shared constitutional vocabulary does not merely highlight a shared perspective about the monarch's limited role in a parliamentary democracy. It also underscores the influence of constitutional borrowing that occurs when drafts are being made or revised. Contrary to what some might think, constitutions do not develop in isolation. Rather, the architects behind these crucial legal texts draw upon various other existing constitutions. The American, French and Polish constitutions, for instance, have had profound impact on shaping many European constitutions. In the similar way, the constitutions of other European monarchies have also been significant references. Take for example the Belgian constitution established in 1831 for the newly formed Belgian state. It drew heavily from the British model of constitutional monarch with limited powers. In the subsequent decade, the Danish constitution of 1849 found inspiration in the Norwegian constitution of 1814 and indeed the Belgian constitution of 1831. In this discussion, it's important to clarify that our references to constitution pertains to the codified constitution of each country, with the notable exception of Sweden and the UK. In Sweden, the constitutional backbone is contained within four fundamental laws, two of which pertain directly to the monarchy. These laws are significantly harder to amend compared to the ordinary laws. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom follows a unique approach where there is no formal distinction between constitutional and ordinary laws. The main provisions of the constitution are found across various acts of parliament. Recently, important constitutional conventions impacting the monarchy have been codified in the cabinet manual. Now let's talk about centrality of the monarchy in the constitution. An examination of various constitutional texts 
uncover the monarchy's pivotal role in each nation's constitution. This prominence is immediately noticeable, as the monarchy typically appears very early in the constitution, serving as a primary focus point. In the sections detailing the institutions of government, the crown or the king is often introduced first. Belgium, interestingly, is the one exception where the parliament takes precedence. Further underlying the monarchy's centrality is the sheer amount of the constitutional real estate it occupies. Generally speaking, the older the constitution, the more space is dedicated to detailing the monarchy's role, powers and function. A prime example is the Norwegian constitution, which hails from 1814, making it second oldest written constitution globally. Out of 110 articles in the constitution, nearly half pertain to the monarchy or mention the king. The lengthiest section, title B, concerns the king, the royal family and the executive power, running a total of 43 articles. Reading the Norwegian constitution, one might be led to believe that the king governs the country. This perception is created by the articles such as Article 3, which vests executive power in the king, and Article 12, which outlines the king's power to choose a council. The king can also delegate the administration of the realm to the council of state during his travels within the country as specified in Article 13. In the similar way, importance is given to the monarchy in the constitutions of Denmark, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. These constitutions devote large sections to the monarchy, encompassing 30 out of 96 articles in Denmark, 25 out of 142 in Netherlands and 30 out of 140 in Luxembourg. Contrastingly, in the most recent codified constitution, the Spanish constitution of 1978, the monarchy is mentioned lower down and receives less attention, 10 articles out of 169. This may be a reflection of Spain's ambivalent attitude towards monarchy, or it may simply demonstrate a concern to prioritize rights and freedoms in the post-Franco constitutions opening sections. Similarly, the Dutch constitution begins with the catalog of fundamental rights before addressing the institutions of government, with the king introduced first. And now let's examine powers of the monarch. Across most countries, with Sweden as the notable exception, the monarch performs a consistent set of functions, summoning and dissolving parliament, appointing and dismissing ministers, including the prime minister, granting royal assent to laws, making war and peace, and acting as a commander-in-chief of the armed forces. While the monarch is formally vested with executive power, many constitutions assign responsibility to ministers, requiring the monarch's decision to be countersigned. Monarchs typically also hold minor constitutional powers like issuing currency, overseeing tax collection, granting pardons and bestowing honors. These powers are largely uniform across most constitutions with the exception of Sweden. Sweden notably reduced the monarchy's power in 1974, relegating the monarch to a purely ceremonial and representative role. The Prime Minister is now elected by the Riksdag and royal assent is no longer needed for bills to become law. While these powers have been significantly diminished over the past two centuries, the monarch still serves as a guardian of the constitution in emergencies, safeguarding democratic and constitutional values. Historic examples include King Juan Carlos of Spain preventing an attempted coup in 1981 and King Håkon VII of Norway rejecting Quisling as head of the government following the German invasion in 1940. These actions reinforce the monarchy's legitimacy. The monarch may also need to intervene if a prime minister breaches the constitution, like dismissing a prime minister who refuses to step down after a vote of no confidence. Yet, such interventions can be controversial and subject to criticism. 
The practice of withholding royal assent could also be used to prevent Parliament from enacting legislation that violates fundamental constitutional values. Recent instances, however, have involved personal rather than constitutional issues. For instance, Grand Duke Henry of Luxembourg's opposition to euthanasia resulted in constitutional amendment to remove the requirement for royal assent. Increasingly, there are calls to make the monarch more accountable, with power to the parliament to require the monarch to abdicate. Ultimately, the exercise of the monarch's reserve powers rely on popular support, as seen in Denmark's Easter crisis of 1920, when King Christian X was forced to back down due to widespread demonstrations. Monarchs need to thread carefully when deploying reserve powers against the government, ensuring they have the people's support. The continuation of the monarchy as an institution and the monarch's position ultimately hinges on the continuing support of the people, as demonstrated by various abdications in the 20th and 21st century. And now, survey findings. During our research, we undertook an intriguing survey across 10 republics, and our findings were, quite frankly, eye-opening. In each of these countries, we found a mix of sentiments toward monarchy, some more in favor, some more opposed. The majority of respondents in republics recognize the role of the monarch as mostly ceremonial. But here's where things take a turn. As we delved deeper, posing the questions of the role of monarchy, but this time adding the option of executive powers, we noticed a significant shift in attitudes. It became apparent that opposition to monarchy, which previously stood at an average of 62% across our sample, peaking in Turkey and being the lowest in Austria, began to diminish. Once we presented the prospect of the monarch having an executive role, the scene dramatically changed. Suddenly, the opposition to monarchy dipped to just 48.3%. In this scenario, Brazil exhibited the highest opposition to monarchy, while France showed the least resistance to monarchy. What does this mean for monarchists aiming to bring back monarchy? This reveals a potential opportunity. The concept of an executive role for the monarch might be the key to reducing opposition and fostering acceptance. The idea of monarchy might be more palatable to the modern world if the monarch has a defined, actionable role within the government. This could very well be the insight monarchists need to strategize for the potential return of monarchy in republics. I'd like to invite you all to share your thoughts and perspectives. How do you perceive monarchy in the modern world? Do you agree with our survey results that suggest a more executive role for the monarchs could reduce opposition to monarchy introduction? Or perhaps you have a different take on all of this. Your voice matters and can truly enrich this conversation. So please drop your thoughts in the comments below. We are eager to read and respond to your opinions. If you found this video informative and engaging, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to our channel for more discussions like this. Also, a shout out to our patrons who help us produce our videos. If you are a patron, you have exclusive access to our monarchy report in 10 republics. And if you're not, support our production. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.